Well, thank you everybody for being here this evening. I'm Elaine Sanders and I'm with the Mark Twain Library and we're thrilled to have you. Tonight we are delighted to bring you an evening with Doug Talley on Nature's Best Hope. This program has been made possible through the collaborative efforts of the Reading Garden Club, New Pond Farm and Highstead. It is always a pleasure when the library has the opportunity to work with these treasured organizations from our town. So tonight's program is a webinar and the audience has been muted. However, we do wish to encourage you to ask questions. Please feel free to type those questions into the Q&A function um, and we will save time at the end to answer as many as we can. The Q&A function is in the menu bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So please feel free to ask your questions. And we're gonna be recording tonight's program. So if the storms that are predicted interfere and you drop off, please know that you'll be able to watch the program in full later on the library's YouTube channel. And it may take us a week or two since the book fair is occurring this weekend, but we'll get it up there for you. And also please encourage your friends and neighbors who could not make it tonight to take time and view the recording. And now I'd like to turn the evening over to Vanessa Tabor of the Reading Garden Club. Vanessa? Thank you. Um, hello everyone, we are, um, Reading Garden Club, New Pond Farm, Mark Twain Library, and Highstead Farm. We all joined together to bring Doug Tellamy to our community. Um, we thank you very much for joining us. Um, the number of people who have responded to us is amazing. There are 684 people who um, are, have made reservations through Mark Twain. So um, we, we do thank you. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about Doug, which is the reason I'm here. Uh, Doug Tallamy is an ecologist, a professor at the University of Delaware, um, a renowned author, and a sought after international speaker. We, um, his ability to make his scientific knowledge turn into a layman's or layman's language is really remarkable. And um, you'll find this out or have found this out as you read his books. Um, in 2001, uh, Doug actually bought a farm in Southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, most of the farm I believe was, um, I hate work, was um, hay production. And in 2001, Doug noticed that um, the hay fields were overrun by um, honeysuckle and oriental um, plants and autumn olives and multiflora roses. Um, and it was all invasive plants. What he noticed um, when he was walking his field was that they were all invasive plants and he didn't see the insects were missing. Um, and so Doug Tabor actually, that's my answer, Doug Talame <laughs> actually um, decided to do research and to study this, um, this um, invasive plants and the uh, lack of insects. Um, so he, he um, actually brought students up to his farm and they, um, they started researching. And in 2007, um, Doug took this research and he creative, um, he wrote a book, I don't wanna be infomercial, but he wrote a book, Bringing Nature Home, how, to, how you can sustain wildlife with native plants. And that book was published in 2007. And in 2020, um, there were 14 books published. It was the 14th published, published book. Um, and um, after he, after he, um, after he wrote this book, um, he realized the ecosystem cannot be sustained by natural parks and, um, and forestry. And he came up with the idea of homegrown national parks. And he shared this idea in his book um, called Nature's Best Hope, a new approach to conservation that starts in your own backyard. And that book um, was published and it's now in his seventh 
um, printing. Um, he is ob obviously a very prolific writer. People love his work. And I believe that he is, um, he is so popular because he takes the scientific knowledge and his research and he puts all of that and he makes it accessible in layman's language. So we're able to read it and we're able to digest it, I believe. Um, but Doug, Doug believes that we all are, um, we, those who follow him, we've all joined a grassroots environmental plan. And we, um, and I think this community by responding so well to Doug being here, I think we can really be proud of, of our, our town and the, the way that people care about their lands. Um, um, I thank you all for being here. Uh, Doug, thank you for being so gracious and um, the program is now yours. Thanks very much, Vanessa. You know, I hope you all can hear me. It is pounding rain out there right now. Uh, and I guess you're getting rain as well. So we're inside. We might as well hear about nature's best hope. And before I tell you about my idea for nature's best hope, I want to return to a book that E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson wrote, I think in 2016 called Half Earth. You've probably heard of it. He spent most of his career uh, worrying about the decline of, of biodiversity of life on our planet. Uh, and this book was uh, maybe, I don't know if it's his last attempt, he's 92 at this point, to try to convince us that we need to save uh, at least half of the earth if we're going to save nature. <clears throat> Most of the book focused on the science that backs up that, that statement. Uh, so when he came out, uh, when this book came out saying we need to save half the earth, there were an awful lot of people who were scratching their heads. A lot of us want to save half the earth. We want to save all the earth, but we're saying, how can we possibly do this? Um, half the earth is already in agriculture, 7.8 billion people in all of our infrastructure in the other half. We don't have a third half that we can save. So how could this be possible? Uh, well, in order to realize uh, EO's dream, we need a new approach to conservation. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. I do believe it is possible to, to save uh, ecosystem function on half the earth. But before we get to that, I want to return to what happened in 2019. We had what we call an oak mast in the Red Oak group. All the members of the Red Oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is the way it looked in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. And I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First, it chewed a little, little hole for its head, forced its head capsule through there. Then it forced its entire body through that little hole. It was a tight squeeze. Looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally, it plopped down. This is a very dangerous time for this insect larva because it is good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the, the surface of the soil, it goes down in about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches in all directions, forms a chamber. And within that chamber, it converts itself to a pupa and then stays there for two years. After two years, it comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses because it looks like they do, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule. And the mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. And they take those mouth parts and chew a hole down into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in it, and that's how the larva gets down there. Now you might wonder why they spend two years underground before they come out as an adult, when they come out the next year. And the answer is it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, after the acorn weevil has left the acorn, that leaves a hole, a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of Timnothorax ants, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after they've left an acorn. And if the ants find a new, new acorn with a new hole, they get very excited because their old acorn is falling apart. So they tell everybody it is time to move. They grab all the larvae, the eggs, they move the entire colony into the new, new uh, acorn in about 30 minutes. Then they post a guard here at the entrance, make sure nobody else comes in, and that's where they'll live for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. What's my point? My point is, is that is 
just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions between animals and plants that comprise the bulk of nature. This is another one, the, re the relationship between jays and oaks. Actually, all over the world, jays and oaks have a very close relationship. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn, they'll fly up to a mile from the parent tree, and then they tap that acorn beneath the surface of the soil. And the object is they're going to go get it during wintertime and have something to eat. But for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one of them is, which means for every four acorns they bury, they are planting three oak trees. And they'll, a single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns in a single winter. So that's how oaks get around. Another specialized interaction between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. That is what they feed their young. They rear their young on carpenter ants. So you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have lots of carpenter ants. And you won't have, have lots of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have facilia. That is the only pollen that that particular bee can rear its young on. And it turns out pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them can only reproduce in the pollen of particular uh, particularly gen genera. So for example, uh, in, in New England, there are at least 13 species of bees that can only reproduce in the pollen of perennial sunflowers. You won't have Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head. Uh, I could talk all night about these specialized relationships that make up nature. The point I want to make though, is that today these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we didn't take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, unfortunately, we can't leave the country as it was because we have it. Um, there's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And that's because we've logged the country repeatedly. We've tilled it, we've drained it, <clears throat> we've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of, of rangeland. That's four and a half times the size of, of Texas. Uh, and, and of course we've paved it or, or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We have drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other remnants to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. You might wonder why we've done this. I wonder why we've done this. I guess that we thought that our nest, planet Earth, was so big we could follow it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. Of course, we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing pretty scary headlines at a regular clip now, like the insect apocalypse is here. Talking about global insect decline. What does that mean for the rest of life on Earth? Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's almost a third of our North American bird population already gone. Then the UN says that, uh, you know, they predict we're going to lose a million species to extinction, probably in the next 20 years. Sorry, I'm about ready to choke here. <coughs> that headline should make you choke. This is not an option, folks. Losing a million species is not an option. We depend on these, these species. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have, have uh, delivered upon the environment and that's upon all of our houses, but that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from lots of people. But those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, E.O. Wilson once again told us what it would mean if we lost our insects. And he did it in a paper way back in 1987 called The Little Things That Run the World. And his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial habitats or terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, even many of our freshwater fish, 
those food webs would collapse and, and those animals would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news here, and, and that is that that doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects. We can save our birds. We can save nature itself. But we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on, on nature, on what we call uh, the products of healthy ecosystems, ecosystem services. Here are a few of the things that, that plants deliver, not just for us, but for everything that's out there. Like oxygen, plants are producing oxygen. They're cleaning water and slowing its, its journey to the sea where it's too salty to use. Carbon capture, enormously important in, in today's world. It's plants that are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, building their tissues out of that carbon, and then pumping the extra carbon through their roots into the soil. Our soils are, are brown or black because of carbon that plant roots have deposited there over the eons. Plants are building topsoil, they're holding it in place, they're preventing floods, they're dampening severe weather, they're converting sunlight into food. If we lose our plants, we're gonna to have to eat sunlight all on our own. That'll be a challenge. What do animals do for plants? They provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds. <clears throat> These are just some of the ecosystem services that are keeping us alive in this planet. So developing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. Never was a good idea, but today it's a terrible idea because, uh, because we've got so many people demanding those services. We've got 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet. We need more ecosystem services today than ever before. Now, there have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our, our relationship with planet Earth, and Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent. He wrote extensively at the, the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. There have been indigenous groups that have been able to do that for, for long periods, but our huge Western societies, our huge uh, um, Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, then going to another area doing the same thing. Not sustainable behavior. Well, Aldo recognized this, and he, he, uh, but he believed that we humans were able to develop what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the earth. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. But he believed we could learn to do those things gently enough that we did not destroy local ecosystems. And that's what he called the land ethic. He wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he did not write about, though, was developing a land ethic where we lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time was so deeply embedded in the culture of, of Aldo Leopold's day. <clears throat> it's still embedded in our own culture, but uh, that's probably why Aldo didn't even recognize it as an option. What I want to argue this evening, though, is that living with nature not only is an option, it is now the only viable option that is left to us. You know, in the past, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We need to save nature, actually reconstruct it where we've dismantled it, where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes, not hanging on by a thread but thrive. Where should we start? Let's go back to private property. Most of the land is privately owned, at least in the U.S. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. If we don't do conservation on private property, we're going to fail. Of course, we can't afford to fail. And that's because we'd be working in areas that are too small, too few, and too isolated from each other to preserve the amount of nature that we need to produce all those ecosystem services we were talking about. There are some low hanging, uh, low hanging fruit options uh, available to us and not all of it is, is, is private property. How about power and pipeline rights of ways? 21 million acres uh, in, in uh, power and pipeline rights of ways. You know, the, the uh, what is it? Rhode Island is 1.5 million acres. 
So uh, this is this is a lot of Rhode Islands up there that's that could be landscaped in a way that preserves an awful lot of biodiversity. Railroad rights away, same thing, another 3 million acres. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, 3 million acres. The Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are big places. Roadside, 17 million acres. That is eight times bigger than uh, uh, Yellowstone National Park. We've got a lot of land that we could use uh, for conservation. Then we have all the places where we, we live. <clears throat> Rural areas, suburbia, urban, urban areas, hundreds of millions of acres in, in those places. So if you add up those, and you can think of other areas, that's 599 million acres that we could be doing conservation on that really right now we're not doing a great, great job on. How big is 599 million acres? It's big. It's bigger than Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, California, even throw Texas in there. Not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. We can do conservation almost anywhere. Now, when I talk about conservation, I'm not using the word correctly. We do want to conserve any parts of nature that are still intact. Absolutely. <clears throat> There's not a lot of it left, though. Um, so I'm really talking about rebuilding nature that we have dismantled. It won't look exactly like it did before we dismantled it, but it doesn't mean we can't reunite enough of those specialized interactions so that you have functioning ecosystems again, even if they're a little bit different from what they used to be. Uh, but in order to do that, we have to start with building blocks, the most important species uh, essential to all terrestrial ecosystems, because not all species, species are contributing to ecosystem function equally. And there are two groups that we cannot do with that. One of them would be the, the flowering plants, and the pollinators that allow those flowering plants to, to reproduce. Uh, the flowering plants are capturing energy from the sun, turning it into food, storing it in their, their plant parts, mostly their leaves. So now we have, we have the energy from the sun stored as food in plant leaves. How are we going to get that to the animals that are running our ecosystems? Most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. They eat invertebrates that have eaten the plants. And it turns out that most of those invertebrates that are transferring energy to other animals are caterpillars. Caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design uh, natural areas that don't have a lot of, of caterpillars, we're going to fail. Those will be failed food webs. Let me give you an example from the Carolina chickadee. That's a chickadee that we have down here in, in southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, you've got the black capped chickadee, they're practically the same bird. Now chickadees are at our feeders all winter long, so we think, well, that's what they need, seed. 50% of their diet in the wintertime is seed. The other 50% is insects. But when they're reproducing, their babies can't eat seeds. So they switch to insects. And if they're in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And chickadees are not exceptions. 96% of our, our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? There's a number of lines of evidence that suggest that, but here's a, 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 a citizen science project that one of my students did, Ashley Kennedy. She put out a call for um, citizen scientists uh, around the, the country, bird photographers, to take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they were carrying food to the nest. Send those pictures to Ashley and she's gonna identify the prey items in the beak and reconstruct the nestling diets for as many birds as she could in North America. And she got thousands of, of pictures. So what you're looking at is a summary of her results for the 20 most common bird families in, in North America. The green bars are the percentage of the nestling diet that is caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominate the diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we, if we built landscapes that didn't have enough caterpillars. Most of our birds would not be able to reproduce. So there's something special about caterpillars. Um, what is it? There's actually several things special about caterpillars. And one of them is that uh, they're soft. Think of this guy as if he's a, a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is, is its exoskeleton, its cuticle, it's, it's made of, of chitin, it's undigestible, and the birds don't want a lot of that. And because caterpillars are soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring it. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear, rear their young, um, they're pretty rough. The beak is like a plunger. They just take that beak and stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of, of 200 aphids. Some of our, our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 
200 aphids or get one caterpillar. Caterpillars are nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein, low percentage of chitin compared to uh, many other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. Much of a beetle is undigestible. And a lot of beetles have very sharp edges. And finally, it turns out the caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate. And birds are vertebrates, and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. So we have to get our, our carotenoids from plants. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. And that's why my, my wife, Cindy, makes sure I have lots of caterpillars, lots of caterpillars, lots of carrots uh, to get my beta carotene, lots of tomatoes to get my lycopene, lots of whatever that is to get my lutein. And when I eat those things, they stimulate my immune system. And I can't think of a better time to have a very strong immune system. Carotenoids are antioxidants. They run around our body, protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, uh, you'll see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this, this male prothonotary warbler who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutines. He takes those lutines <clears throat> builds pigments out of them, puts them in his, his feathers. And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. But where's he getting his carotenoids from? From what he eats, of course, but carotenoid levels are not equally distributed across bird prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. <clears throat> Excuse me. You have far more carotenoids than other types of prey items. Here are the adult caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves. Fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. It's just the caterpillars that eat the green leaves where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm down way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. This and other studies are suggesting uh, very, very powerfully that caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. It's really uh, looking like they are essential components of bird diets. So let's just say birds need, need caterpillars. <coughs> Excuse me. Birds need caterpillars. How many do they need? Is one or two enough? One or two a day enough? Well, let's go. Let's go back to chickadees. We've got a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes six thousand to nine thousand caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. And after they leave the nest. Uh, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days, but they're flying all around, so it's, it's impossible to count those caterpillars. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars to get one clutch of a bird that weighs a third of an ounce, four pennies worth of, of bird, to the point where they're independent. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you do, because in so many places, that's all, all we have is our yards, you have to have all those caterpillars in your yard. Chickadees forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not filing flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way that does not produce all those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is directly related to those bird declines that people are measuring. We went to the original data set from Rosenberg et al. That's the group, the Smithsonian group that, that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. We divided the terrestrial bird species into two groups, the species that require insects at some point of their life, typically when they're, they're breeding, and the species that do not. So things like doves and finches can actually reproduce on seeds. They don't need any insects. Well, that group didn't lose any, any uh, individuals at all in the last 50 years, but the species that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species in the last 50 years. This doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that there is a tight relationship with the, between the availability of, of, of insects, bird food, and the well-being of those birds. And you know, this is not rocket science. If you take away the bird food, the birds disappear. So uh, if we want birds and all the other things that require insects that I haven't talked about, we have to start landscaping in a way that creates these, these insects, particularly caterpillars. How do we do that? And I recognize that's a, that's a new goal for landscaping. In the past, we've thought of one thing when we're landscaping, and that is how do we make them pretty? <clears throat> 
you know, we thought humans and nature were separate and, and, and we didn't have to have natural areas at home. There was a lot of happy nature out there someplace else. Not true anymore. So we now have to have functional ecosystems right where we live. And you're not going to have that without caterpillars. So how do we landscape in a way that creates caterpillars? Well, you put the plants that make those caterpillars into, into your yard, which seems simple enough. But there is a catch, and that is that most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about which ones we choose. We have to choose the ones that do make a lot. And we have to be fussy because the caterpillars themselves are fussy. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. <clears throat> you can have all the crepe myrtle and all of the boxwood and all of the, the Bradford pear and all of the ginkgos and all of the hosta, all of the plants from Asia that we typically landscape with that you want and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's going to make a new monarch butterfly is milkweed. That is called host plant specialization. Uh, and it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Why? Because plants have made them that way. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've captured, they, they, they've uh, <clears throat> loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps, defense that keeps most of the, the uh, insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there during the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that wanna eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. But we do know that insects eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. Every plant lineage, there's a lot of plant lineages out there, and every single one protects itself with a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And an insect species cannot adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two plant lineages that are really similar in how they defend themselves, and they get good at getting around those particular defenses. They develop enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize uh, uh, the insect's expo exposure to those particular compounds. But it takes a long period of evolutionary history with all, all of those uh, plants in order for those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do fall into place, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant lineage. So when you take milkweed out of your yard, the monarch does not start to eat your crepe myrtle. It disappears can't eat anything else, it's locked into it. And that's why when we bring in ornamental plants or invasive species from other continents and they start to displace our, our native plants, it destroys food webs. Our native insects cannot eat those plants. So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to rebuild the food webs that support our local ecosystems where we've already destroyed them, we have to choose the right plants or it's not gonna work. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how well it does work when we do choose the right plants. And I'm gonna start with, with uh, our property here in Oxford, Pennsylvania that Vanessa was telling you about in the beginning. Uh, there was a farm that was broken up. We, we bought part of it um, and it had been mowed for hay. Um, and of course, this is what it looked like when, when uh, we built the house. They stopped mowing, of course, when we built the house. And what came back, of course, were the, the rootstocks of all of those, those non-native plants, those invasive species, Oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and all kinds of nasty things. Um, our, our lights just flickered, so I certainly hope uh, we don't lose our power. If I disappear, that's what happened. Uh, so the first thing we had to do was get rid of of uh, these invasive plants. You're not gonna restore ecosystem function with Asian plants. That's my wife, Cindy. She's getting ready to clear our 10 acres of, of all of those plants. She did that um, and she did it with a lot of work. Uh, so if you have an invasive plant problem and a lot of people do, don't give up. It is possible to get rid of them. Um, I won't, won't say that it's easy, but Cindy did it, you can do it too. She did it on 10 acres, by the way. What was I doing while she was working hard? I was telling her she was doing a great job, but I also was putting plants back. My job was to rebuild that ecosystem by bringing in the plants that support the caterpillars that run that food web. So this is an example. I wanted to, to attract the Canadian outlet to our property. 
Uh, that's what a Canadian owlet looks like. I'd never even seen a Canadian owlet. That's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. Well, in order to have Canadian owlets, you have to have meadow rue. That is the only plant they eat. They're host plant specialists on meadow rue, just like monarchs are host plant specialists on milkweed. But we didn't have any meadow rue. The area had been farmed. It was an old farm, 300 years old. All the meadow rue was long gone from anywhere around here. So I got some seeds from someplace, planted them, grew very well. But this was early on. I, you know, I really didn't think the Canadian owlet would ever find my little patch of meadow rue. So I didn't even go out and check it for, uh, well, it must have been a month and a half after I planted it. But then I did walk by for another reason, and the plants were covered with, with Canadian owlets. It had, it, they had found it right away. I'm still surprised at that. So now we've got a good population of meadow rue and Canadian owlets. We've added two species to our property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. Uh, this, this beautiful moth actually has nothing to do with goldenrod. It is a specialist on, on this plant, Biden's Aristosa, ditch daisy. I did know where there was some ditch daisy in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. But it took about a year for the moths to find our, our Bidens, but they have found it. And now we've got a good population of both Bidens Aristosa, Ditch Daisy, and the Goldenrod Stowaway. So now we've added four species to the property. Same story with the Hackberry Emperor. I wanted the Hackberry Emperor, uh, not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs here. It's one of the species that ought to be here. But as its name suggests, it is a specialist on Hackberry, on Celtus. We didn't have any Hackberry, so I planted Hackberry. Took four years for the butterflies to find our hackberry, but they finally did. And now we have a good population of those as well. So now we've added six species. I did not plant goldenrod, uh, came in on its own, but along with it came many of the things that specialize on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet. I found one of these guys right outside our back porch uh, this afternoon. Beautiful caterpillar. The Arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why it hasn't found our goldenrod, but uh, it hasn't. That's what the caterpillars look like. So this is, this is part of the fun. Um, this is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and I check, check our plants for, for this caterpillar. One of these years I'm going to find it and that'll be a great day. I planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. You know, I, I hear Virginia creeper does not have a good reputation, uh, but I don't know why. It's, a, it's an excellent native plant. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down, has good fall cover, color, makes uh, very valuable berries for the birds in the fall, very high in fat. That's what migrating and, and overwintering birds need. It's an excellent pollinator plant that nobody talks about. The flowers are small and inconspicuous, but remember, when you're making a pollinator garden, you're making it for the pollinators, not for you. Uh, and they love, they love these little flowers. And it's the, uh, it's the best host plant for the large sphinx moths that are the primary component of cardinal uh, nestling diets. So things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx are all on Virginia creeper. I want to see if I could get the double tooth prominent. Uh, at our house, uh, just because it's such a, a cool caterpillar. It's an elm specialist. You know, even if you don't like caterpillars, you got to love this guy. Uh, well, we didn't have any elm. Um, you know, elm was, of course, wiped out by the Dutch elm disease, but there were two or three big elms, there still are, at the University of Delaware that did not die from the Dutch elm disease, and they make a lot of seed every year. Got some of the seeds, I planted them. Elms grow really quickly. The seeds germinate in six days, um, that was 19 years ago. Those trees are about 80 feet tall now. So big success. Caterpillar came right away. American elm. Wanted the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. So of course we needed evening primrose. We didn't have any of that. So I got it, planted it. The moth came, spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. And I planted lots of, of oaks. Now, those are just examples of the plant lineages that I've, I've added to the property, but I want to focus on oaks for a while because they're such important plants. This is the Bedford oak in Bedford, New York. Uh, people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. But a lot of people see that as a problem. They say, well, I don't want to plant an oak on my property because I won't live long enough to, uh, to enjoy it. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right. You won't live long enough. But if you can enjoy what your oak is doing for your property, right from the start, you can enjoy it immediately. And I can say that 
with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or as two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately they started to rebuild that, that moth-based food web that, that drives diversity in our house by attracting things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, uh, Suzuki's promolactus, the uh, red wash caterpillar, the yellow bested moth, orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the street dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the orange packed smoky wing, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panapoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to use the oaks on our property. And they come right away. <clears throat> this is a pin oak that has just popped its head above the leaves. And here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the leaves of that tree. You don't have to wait decades or hundreds of years for your oaks to start to contribute. They contribute immediately. This is what our property looks like today. Um, look, we got a little, little lawn here. We're very traditional. But um, we put the plants back, or at least we put some of the plants. I'm still adding adding plants. Uh, but about four years ago, I made it a goal to try to take a picture of every species of moth that is now making a living on those plants at our house. It's a measure of how successful our food web is. Uh, and I'm still at it, but I am now up to 1,130 species of moths that I photographed on our, our property. That's more species of moths than all, all the birds in, in North America. And we have 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So in one 240 thousandths of the land mass, we have 44% of all the moss species that occur in the entire state. And because so many of those moss species are bird food, we have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our property. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline we saw last year. The World Wildlife Fund says that we've lost two thirds of wildlife since 1970. But I'm thinking not at our house. Uh, at our house, I'm sure we have increased biodiversity by at least two thirds and it didn't take nearly that long. And we did it simply by putting the plants back. It was not that hard. So these are, you know, these are frightening, uh, very depressing headlines, but be aware you can turn it around. We all have to do it, but we, all we have to do is put the plants back and we can, we can turn these numbers around. I know what you're thinking now. Um, we have 10 acres and most people have smaller properties in, in the suburbs. Uh, will it work on a smaller piece of property? And that's a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri, where they have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. They are in a typical suburban development. All their neighbors have the big lawns. When they moved in, they got rid of the major invasive plant there, which was armor honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle. And they put in a lot of species of native plants and a water feature they call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that were using their yard. They're up to 149 bird species, including 35 warbler species. Just to put that in, in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. And they did that on 0.6 acres. Does it work on smaller properties? Yes, it does. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago because right on the other side of this wall here is one of the runways of O'Hare Airport. Right over here is Kennedy Expressway. Pam has one tenth of an acre and it's not connected to any natural area at all. Uh, it's three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. So it's a little teeny island. It's a pretty island, uh, but she did the same thing. She got rid of her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, water feature for the birds. And then she sat back and started to count the birds. She's up to 120 species that have used her yard, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. If you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Pam's house in Chicago. What about city centers though? You know, 82% of us live in cities these days. <clears throat> well, in 2014, I was staring at, at this plant, Asclepius uh, tuberosa butterfly weed, which reminds me, uh, we have a marketing issue with our native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't plant them. So let's not call this butterfly weed, let's call it Monarch's Delight. So 2014, I'm staring at Monarch's Delight. The first thing I saw were two species of leafcutter bee, megachylid bees. There was a big one and a smaller one. Um, I know they're megachylid bees, they're leafcutters because they collect their pollen on their tummies, not on their, their legs. 
Well, they have very strict requirements. They're not going to be in an area unless they have pollen and nectar, but also soft leaves. Leaves of red bud are perfect because they cut out the edges of, of the leaves and leave these little semicircles. They roll up what they cut out and stuff that roll with full of pollen. And that's where they, they lay their eggs. They lay their eggs on that pollen, seal up the, the little package and stuff it into a crack or a crevice. And that's how leaf cutter bees reproduce. Well, there was a red bud right next to Monarch's Delight. So they had everything they needed. That's why they were there. Pretty sure that's why there were bumblebees there as well. Bumblebees, of course, overwinter as queens. All the workers die. So when they come out in the spring, they have to do all the work themselves. They have to start the colony, do all the foraging. Every bumblebee you see in, in early in the spring is a queen. And what they need is very efficient forage. And that's exactly what red bud supplies. It, lots of blooms. They can, they can get that colony started. There were a couple species of bumblebees there. And then I saw a monarch. Actually, I saw two monarchs. Now, this was June in 2014. In 2013, I had gone the entire year without seeing a single monarch. That was the low point in the, the monarch population. Only 3.6% of the Eastern monarchs left compared to 1976. Uh, and, and June is early in the year to be seeing a monarch this far, far north. So I was, I was impressed. Maybe the, the, the monarchs weren't gonna disappear after all. Why were they there? Well, they had, they had monarchs delight. And there was another species of milkweed there too. I think it's purple milkweed. Uh, so they had everything they needed. They had uh, nectar, but they also had their host plant. They could lay their eggs. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan. Uh, if you haven't heard about the High Line, it's, it's, a, con, it's a renovated, elevated railroad. It had been abandoned for years, uh, for decades, really. And somebody went up there and, and saw there were a bunch of native plants growing all on their own. So um, they made it a tourist destination. They fixed it up, planted a lot more plants. Not all of them are native, but most of them are. <clears throat> uh, but this is, this, this is the extent of the nature there. It's about a three-foot strip that follows the, the High Line. This is Rick Dark. He was always after me to go see the wonderful plants in the High Line. I'm not much of a city boy, so I always drag my feet. Um, and, you know, seeing beautiful plants with nothing using them is actually depressing to me. And that's what I thought I would see. This is the middle of Manhattan, 30 feet above the taxis, right in the middle of everything. What is going to come colonize these plants? Well, I was completely wrong. Somebody has just done a study of the native bees and then on the, the High Line. They're up to 30 species using, using the High Line. And there are birds there. So it, it convinced me that, you know, if thoughtful native planters can bring life back to the middle of Manhattan, we can do this anywhere and succeed anywhere. But there are four keys to success if we're going to succeed in a big way. And one of them is we've got to shrink the area that we have in lawn in this country. We have over 40 million acres of lawn nationwide, which is bigger than all of New England combined. And that's a 2005 statistic. So, you know, we've got a lot more than that. Uh, dedicated to an ecological deadscape. We've got lawn because it's a status symbol. Uh, it, you know, it's, it, it makes our neighbors think we are good citizens, that we are wealthy, and that we can follow the rules. Uh, so, but, you know, 40 million acres, that's, that's too much. We can't afford to do that. So I'm suggesting that we cut the area of lawn in half. The area of lawn that we keep, we will still manicure, we'll still send the social message that, that we are on board. Uh, we're, you know, we're not renegades, but we're going to plant half of the area that's in lawn now with productive plants. And if we do that in half the area that's in lawn, we can, that's 20 million new acres that we can put towards uh, a, we can create a new national park. If we do it at home, we can call it Homegrown National Park, and that's what I am calling it. It's bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. Homegrown National Park will be the biggest park in the country. What do you get when you put some part of nature at home? you get the opportunity to develop a personal relationship with nature on your own, at your own pace, your own time, maybe for the first time in your life, maybe rekindling one that you had as a, as a child. And you could do it avoiding crowds. I don't know if you've seen the, the uh, headlines in, in the New York Times. 375 million people went to national parks this, this past summer. 
Um, <laughs> you, all you do is you see people when you go there. It's free. There is no, there's no admission fee. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the, the pike. No travel hassles. You get to experience the natural world alone. And I don't know how you can develop that personal relationship with nature if it's mediated by somebody else. This is personal, you and nature alone. And this is particularly important for our kids who are suffering from nature deficit disorder. So we're trying, we get 30 kids, we put them on a bus with a teacher, they drive for an hour, they walk around a natural area, teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back in the bus and they, they go home. And that's their exposure to the natural area, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really been an exposure to 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of the natural world at home, all they have to do is go outside alone. No parental supervision. Let them work it out on their own. Why is that important? If they don't have that personal relationship, these are the future stewards of our planet. Without, without knowing what they're stewarding or why they're stewarding it, without loving it, they're going to be lousy stewards. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I am learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest piece of nature. It's a patch of grass with a hedge, but there are anole lizards there. So she discovered that and sent me this picture to describe how you hunt uh, uh, lizards in Hawaii. You get in the ground, you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards don't see you coming. Then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No smiling, this is serious business. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium, you learn how to take care of it, you learn how to steward the natural world. You've got that personal relationship. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground in her best dress catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture, so who knows. Uh, but I guarantee she's going to remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her, her life. Uh, and I also guarantee that's going to help her be a good steward of the planet. If you want your kids to do more than, than catch lizards, get this book, Nancy Stranisti's Nature Play at Home, dozens of examples of how to expose your kids to the natural world. And if you wanna join Homegrown National Park, uh, you can do that now. This is our new website, homegrownnationalpark.org. Doesn't cost you anything, there's no membership. You're simply registering where your property is and the amount of area that you are going to plant or have planted in, in native plants. We're going for that 20 million acres uh, this is the call to action. Uh, what we're trying to do, you know, people have said, oh, you only talk to the choir. That's because only the choir invites me. Uh, but this is, a, this is, we're trying to use social media here to get people to recognize people everywhere that everybody has an important role in conservation. And if social media can get people to join, um, that's great. You can click on, on your county and uh, your little piece of the world will light up and anybody else who's doing it will light up as well. We're trying to uh, get a new map developer so that you can click on the map and see everybody in the whole country. We're going to build connectivity uh, and get people interested to expand uh, conservation in this country. That's the goal anyway. So, okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. What plants are we going to put in the area we take out of, of lawn? Some of them, I'm going to argue, have to be what I call keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. This is the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle of, of the arch. If you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of the local food web, the food web collapses. And that's because keystone plants are making most of the food. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of that caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the, of the keystone plants in, in the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that are holding up that house. They're essential. You can't build a house out of wallpaper, but they're not the only thing that's gonna go in your house. It's just, just something that has to be there. So the question no longer is simply, are natives better than non-natives ecologically? On average, they certainly are. But there are a lot of native plants that are not supporting very much either. Uh, so the question really is, do we want to put the most productive native species that are going to support the most pollinators and the most caterpillars in our yards or not? I get a, an email once in a while uh, from somebody saying, don't you know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia, actually grew in North America 7 million years ago? That makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in, in uh, North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native or not. 
but I'm not going to have that argument because that's not the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're doing anything or not. Um, I don't care if ginkgos grew in the moon 7 million years ago. They support zero species of, of caterpillars. They're taking up space. Uh, they're pretty, yeah, but um, they're not contributing to your local, local food web. What's contributing more than anything else? Well, in 84% of the counties of North America, it's one of our oaks. In the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars, over 950 species nationwide. There's no other plant genus that comes close to that. And this is what keystone oaks are doing in my yard in terms of supporting the, the biodiversity. Now, remember, I've, I've taken pictures of 1,130 species of, of moss, just moss so far. I, I'll get to the butterflies. I haven't gotten there yet. Out of the 1,130 species, 130 species, 981 have known host plants. So there's more than 150 or so that we don't know what they're eating. But out of the 981, 287 species use oaks. Now we've got 69 genera of native woody plants on our property and only one of them is the oaks, genus Quercus. And we have hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity, but they're supporting 29% of our moss species diversity. That's the role of a keystone plant. Imagine what would happen to the diversity in our house if we took oaks away. How do you find out what the keystone plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder on the National Wildlife Federation website, uh, put in your zip code and the rank list of the most productive woody and herbaceous plant genera for your county will pop up. This is what a typical list will look like for most areas in the East. Um, the native oaks, native cherries, native willows. Notice I say native, native, native. If I go to the nursery and I say, I wanna buy a cherry, um, I guarantee you they're going to sell me an uh, ornamental cherry from, from Asia. If I wanna buy a willow, they'll sell me a weeping willow from, from Turkey. Uh, even if I ask to buy an oak, chances are good I'll get an English oak or, or Quercus Sagittarius, the sawtooth oak from China. Specify that you want a native oak. We've got 91 species of oaks in this country. There are plenty of species that will fit your, your needs. You don't have to use a non-native one. And if you do use a non-native member of these important genera, you're going to reduce caterpillar use by 65%. We've done that experiment. These are the most important uh, her herbaceous genera. Golden rods are always way up there. The various genera that asters were broken up into. Um, native, well, all the sunflowers are native. Not only are they best at supporting caterpillars, golden rods support 110 species of caterpillars. Um, they're also best at supporting specialist bees. You want, when you're making a pollinator garden, you want to plant for the specialist because the generalist can use those plants as well. Solidago, asters, and helianthus will support over 40 species of bees in your yard that won't be there if you don't have those plants. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to invite a lot of insects to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security light, which of course is not the goal. Um, there's a lot of, of, of uh, research, uh, much of it coming out of Europe, documenting that light pollution at night is one of the major causes of insect decline. These are all the ways that, that it kills insects. Um, you know, this is actually good news to me. We have to turn around insect decline. We, we can't tolerate it. We've already lost 45% of the insects on this planet. They're the little things that keep us alive, remember. So if we can do that by flicking a switch, by turning out lights at night, we're getting off easy. That's, that's a great solution. But I know what you're going to say. You can't turn the light off over your garage uh, because the, uh, the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on that light. So it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to realize is that the Batman doesn't come very often. Uh, and if you don't want to do that, take the white light out of your security light, the white bulb, and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED bulb is, is the best uh, because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects than our white wavelengths. If we switched out our white bulbs for yellow bulbs overnight, we would save billions of insects and probably billions of, of dollars too because LEDs are much more energy efficient. Uh, so we're going to shrink the lawn, we're going to put in keystone plants, we're going to turn out our lights, uh, and then we're going to invite Mosquito Joe to come and kill of all, all of our insects. We have no, no shortage of, of the ways we like to kill our insects. This is a booming business around the country. Um, 
Of course, it's it's fogging mosquitoes. Uh, Mosquito Joe will tell you this is okay because this is a natural product, uh, and he's right. This is it's a pyrethroid. It's it's uh, you know very similar to what's found in chrysanthemums. Um, but you know, cyanide is a natural product too. So I'm not sure that's a good, a good argument. He'll also say it only kills mosquitoes and, and that is just not the case. I don't know if you saw the headlines last year and we're actually moving into that area right now when the monarchs start to migrate, big monarch kills after Mosquito Joe got through fogging them. Hundreds of monarchs dead, dead on the ground. This kills all the insects it comes in contact with. The big deal is it doesn't work. You don't kill, you don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You control them in the larval stage. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of them. Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50% of them. So not even close to being effective. And that's why he has to keep coming back and back and back uh, and, and killing all the other, the other insects. So if you really want to control mosquitoes at your house, um, try mosquito dunks. Get a bucket, fill it full of water. People say, how big a bucket? It doesn't matter. The bigger, the better. Fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or, or hay, let it ferment for a couple of days. What you're doing is building up the, the uh, population of algae and diatoms in, in your bucket. And that's what mosquito larvae eat. Adult mosquito, female mosquitoes that wanna lay their eggs, find that irresistible. They lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you throw in a mosquito dunk. It's, this is a product you get at the hardware store, it costs $9. Um, and one of these little discs, it's Bacillus thuringiensis. It's uh, a natural bacterium that kills aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic diptera in, in your bucket is a mosquito. So you put it in there and the mosquito larvae eat it and, and they die. Very targeted. It doesn't kill anything else. If you get a, a dragonfly larva in there, it's not going to hurt it. If your dog licks it or a bird drinks it, it's not going to hurt it at all. You might want to put a screen uh, over it so chipmunks and things don't, don't fall in and drown themselves. But um, otherwise, very effective. The fourth thing we need to do is to design landscapes that allow caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of, of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves, it then spins a cocoon and hangs from, from one of the branches, then it emerges as an adult, and then it does it all over again. And I wish everything did that, but most species don't. Most species complete, they finish growing as a caterpillar and then they drop from the tree and they try to tunnel underneath the ground, pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree. And we mow and compact the soil around our trees to the point where it's too hard for caterpillars to, to get underground. So any caterpillar developing in these trees drops down and dies. <clears throat> this becomes an ecological trap. We don't want to do that. And you know that we landscape like this pretty much everywhere. And of course, the cement landscape is even less of a viable option for caterpillars. This is what most people do. You get a big tree in a yard. Uh, we're just starting to measure how well caterpillars do in a situation like this, but I guarantee they're going to do better in a situation like this, where you've got a tree and then a layered landscape. Maybe a dogwood here, a native azalea and ferns and ground cover. This is the safe site for those caterpillars. They can drop down, the soil's not compacted, easily get to safety to pupate. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. Uh, this is how you, you shrink the lawn. You put beds around your trees. They're all safe sites. You're not gonna walk in there and trample anything. Uh, <clears throat> this is where you can use your, your uh, ground covers, things like uh, wild ginger or may, may apple or foam flower or ferns, great ground covers. This is a, a uh, hotel in Athens, Georgia. Uh, these are red maples. Any caterpillar developing on these red maples will drop down into this safe site. Even though it's the middle of a city, they can complete their development. So we can do a lot better with how we landscape under our trees if we're thinking about the needs of the caterpillars that run those diverse ecosystems. Uh, one, uh, another grad student, Desiree Narango, has, has uh, um, produced a lot of data that suggests there is room for compromise in our plant choice, which to me is good news. She worked in the the suburbs of Washington, D.C. on Carolina chickadees and asked the simple question, um, how well do chickadee populations do? How well they, can they be sustained in suburban landscapes that are landscaped primarily with native plants versus ones landscaped primarily with, with non-native plants, introduced plants? 
when they're landscaped with introduced plants, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you reduce the amount of bird food by 75%. Those uh, landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So the nest box is up in every landscape, but the birds would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even going to try. If they did try, they contained, uh, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, the nest produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to, to fledge. So if you put all that information into a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in your yard from none to 100%, this is what you get. The dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the, the uh, adults that die every year. Chickadees don't live very long. And if you reproduce at that rate, you've got a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you've got a growing population. But if you make fewer babies below this line here, you've got a shrinking unsustainable population. Right here is where those lines intersect very generously speaking. So you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass. And we look at woody plant biomass because that's where chickadees forage on your property, non-native without destroying the, the local food web. In other words, you have to have 70% of your woody plant biomass to be productive natives if you wanna have breeding birds. But this is an area of compromise, which I think is great because of my message was you can't have any non-native plants at all. Um, might have very small audiences because we love our, our, our non-native plants. Remember, it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of native plants. If we include these guys, we can tolerate these guys. Can you use natives formally? Um, of course you can. I got this picture from Lynn O'Shaughnessy this, this past year. You can't get more formal than that. This is taken by a drone, you know, way up there. So this is a big garden. Every plant in that garden is a native plant. <clears throat> Remember, our native plants are used in formal gardens in Europe every day. And I, I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Can we get a pollinator garden into a typical suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It tells people this isn't just a pile of weeds that you forgot to mow down. You're satisfying the needs of several species of bees. It's not very big. You can make it bigger, uh, but if everybody did it, it would, it would uh, meet the needs of an awful lot of bees. Remember why we need pollinators. It's not because they pollinate a third of our crops. It's actually about a 12th of our crops. It's because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet, not an option. Where do we need pollinators? Everywhere we need plants, which is everywhere. How about this design, Drew Latham design? much bigger. It's formal enough. Imagine the amount of life that is here versus the amount of life that's, that's right here. Seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can, and more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota has a cost-sharing program. It's called the Lawn to Legium program, where the, the, the state pays you to convert some or all of your lawn to appropriate Minnesota uh, prairie plants. New program in Pennsylvania, it's only two years old, lawn conversion program. You can get up to $5,000 per acre to convert your lawn into uh, native plants. This was designed to help watersheds, uh, but this is a perfect example. In helping watersheds with native plants, you also help all the biodiversity uh, around you. There's an island off Florida where uh, they're paying homeowners to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. Rather than fining people if they've got an endangered species on the yard, pay them to take care of it. Everybody would want one. Missouri, uh, I think St. Louis, Missouri and, and Fayetteville, Arkansas had a uh, uh, bounty on calorie pears. You take out a calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. And, and even public utilities are getting into the act, giving people $100 coupons to put, uh, particularly in the West, San Antonio, give you a $100 coupon to put in water efficient native species rather than water, water thirsty non-natives. And of course, the, the great uh, lawn conversion programs in California, up to $2 per square foot rebate for taking out that, that lawn that nobody has the water for and replacing it with appropriate xeric plants. 
I think we made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And, and a, a serious one is that we've come to think of nature as optional. In other words, we don't need it. We like it, but it's not essential. So when, when resources are in short supply, when push comes to shove, nature always takes a back seat. I was at the Cincinnati Zoo before the uh, virus broke out and they have this wall sized poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We want to save wildlife for future generations to enjoy. It was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. We want to save these wonderful places so the future generations can appreciate them. And I get that they are entertaining, but nature's not there just for entertainment. No wonder we don't think it's essential. Entertainment's not essential, but nature is essential. We need it so that we have future generations, not just so we can entertain them. It's a little bit more urgent. We've also assumed that, that humans and nature cannot coexist. And we, we talked about this. If we restrict conservation just to areas where there are not a lot of humans, we're gonna fail because those areas are too small too isolated to sustain the amount of nature that we need to sustain. David Quammen has this, this uh, perfect analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides. So we need to, we need to glue our rug back together again. E.O. Wilson says we have to save half the Earth. We need to save ecosystem function on all of the Earth. So we're not just building biological carters that connect existing habitats. We're gonna, we've got to create viable habitat where we've totally destroyed it. For the first time in modern history, we're gonna coexist with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave earth stewardship just to a few specialists, a few conservation biologists, few ecologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet, but I don't know why, because everybody in the planet depends entirely on the quality of earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody bear responsibility for good earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder once said, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets, you've taught them. We're really good at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. That doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. Right now, so many of us feel powerless. The earth's problems are huge. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn. One person can use keystone plants. One person can get rid of their invasive plants. One person can put in a pollinator garden. One person can totally revitalize the little ecosystem on their property and enhance their local ecosystem instead of, of degrade it. And it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You get depressed. Just worry about your little piece of the problem, planet that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious that's where you're gonna, gonna work. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help, help a, uh, a, a park or a preserve. They're all underfunded, understaffed. As a volunteer, they will love you. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power. We certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own. Now, I think I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Doug, thank you very much. Thank you for opening their eyes to the problems out there and more importantly, opening their eyes to what, how we can make a difference. So truly appreciate that. We do have questions for you. Um, I know that there were several questions about how could somebody get involved in helping spread educational messages out there? Um, can, are there certain organizations that they could become involved in? Should they go to their State Department of Environmental Protection? What would you recommend for an activist? Yeah, all, all of the above. I mean, social media is such a powerful thing these days. 
Uh, and, and I don't do it myself because I'm an old fogey, but everybody else does. Um, Instagram, Facebook, we can get kids in East Timor to wear Nikes overnight. So, you know, it's the reason we're not doing this. The reason we've got an adversarial relationship with nature instead of a collaborative one is that it's part of our culture. We have to change our culture. Um, don't buy into the, to the advertisements that you get telling you if you have a dandelion in your lawn, you're a bad person. I mean, this is what we've been, we've grown up with. We have to fight back against that. You all know people, talk to them, say, hey, look, this is why I write these books, folks. Give somebody a book and say, hey, you know, because it's not a sound bite. Um, it's tricky though. You can't go to your neighbor and say, you're living wrong. You got to live the way I want to live. Um, you want to get along with your, your neighbor, but probably the best thing to do is to work on your own property, make it a, a model so that people say, hey, I want a property like that. That's an advertisement in, in and of itself. But um, all of the organizations, you know, we, we have Homegrown National Park, but that's not we just want to inform people, but they should go to Audubon or the National Wildlife Federation or, or Sierra Club or any of these others that are the organizations that will help you enact these things. And any one of those have uh, ways that, that you can become an, an activist. Thank you for those great suggestions. Also, Chris would like to know if you have limited time to conduct restoration, what would your hierarchy of actions be? Um, and what are the worst offending invasives <laughs> Two different questions. Uh, you know, if I had limited time, I would plant a tree. Trees are much easier to plant than a lot of people say, well, I'm going to plant a meadow. That's actually the hardest thing that, that you can do. Um, just stopping mowing your yard is, is uh, there are problems with that because then it looks like you're not following the social, social norms. So reducing the area of lawn by mowing less, but having, having we call them beauty, beauty strips, um, you know, that, that mower's width along the edge of the driveway or, or the sidewalk, and then everything else is well planted that says this is intentional. Uh, so that's that's pretty easy to do. But the easiest thing to do is to plant a tree and then build a, a bed around it. Um, this fall, right now, go out and find an acorn. If it's a member of the white oak group, plant it this fall. If it's the red oak group, put it in the refrigerator and plant it in the, in the spring. Um, real easy, real easy. And that people say, oh, it'll take forever to grow there. My acorns that I planted uh, 19 years ago are you know, 50, 60 feet tall now. It doesn't take forever. They grow slowly in the beginning, but then they, then they really take off. Um, and, and that's also the most effective thing you can do because woody plants support a lot more diversity than do herb herbaceous plants. Um, what's the most, the, the worst invasive? It depends on where you live. And he was concerned about the vines. Um, that yeah, we have Oriental bittersweet and, and, and where I am now, porcelain berry is one of the worst. It just overgrows everything. It's a kudzu of the north. Um, they're very destructive and they send out these roots, put down roots everywhere. So um, that's my number one target on my property now is porcelain berry that has in, invaded. So uh, that Japanese stilt grass, another huge problem. Uh, and nobody's got a good solution for that. It's an annual. You can mow it and that works, but you can't, you can't mow the world. Then you're mowing everything else too. So we've got some real problems out there. <laughs> it does seem like it. Um, people have talked about the oaks and that they've like, they planted some, but the deer seem to be getting to those. Saddles. That's another problem. <laughs> so how do we battle we, our deer? We have an overabundance of deer. They, just like the insects, prefer the native plants. So you're right, you plant an oak, the deer will get it immediately and they won't touch your burning bush. They won't touch your, your uh, Bradford pear and all the other things that we plant. So, and that's what's created a lot of these invasive plants because it tips the competitive balance. Our natives are actually very competitive plants with these non-natives if there were no deer eating them and not the, the, the non-natives. What's the solution to that? You know, we have taken away the deer predators. We can either put the predators back, bring back the cougars, bring back the wolves, or we have to control them ourselves. But having them 14 times over the carrying capacity, which is about where they are now, it's destroying the forest. 
Uh, it's created a serious Lyme disease issue. Um, and it makes it's it's hard to get these plants back. What did I do at home? I've got I've got uh, wire cages, uh, galvanized five foot tall uh, galvanized wire cages. I get it at Home Depot, and I, you know, I make them wide enough so that your tree has a, a, a room to expand. Don't make it do this. But I've been using those saved cages since we moved in. I just keep moving moving them around, and yeah, it's ugly, but you get a tree out of it because if you don't they're going to nail it right away. Good to know. Thanks. Um, Nancy would like to know, how do we determine what insects are native to our area and so how we can plant appropriately for them? Most insects are native to your area. We have a few bad actors and, and, and they get a lot of press. Gypsy moth, uh, the emerald ash borer, uh, you know, terrible. Um, hemlock woolly adelgid, the brown marmorated stink bug, um, and, and it's easy, go on the web, you can look up each one of those and, and see what they look like. But most of the insects you encounter uh, are going to be native and, and should be conserved as, as best as, as possible. Uh, that uh, native plant finder will tell you which insects are eating which plants, or at least which, which caterpillars are eating which plants. So, uh, you know, if you're worried, oh, is this a gypsy moth or not? Um, and you know, if, if I don't like to encourage people to send me emails, but if you have a picture of an insect and you don't know what it is, you can send me that. It only takes a second to identify it. I don't mind that that at all. Uh, and then you don't you don't have to worry about it. Right away, people assume that everything they find is a bad guy. It's the opposite. Almost everything you find is a good guy. Sounds good. Also, um, where can we find information on best mowing practices for fields to prevent having them turn into brush and forest and to preserve the seeds and insects? <laughs> uh, well, you know, in this part of the country, we get a lot of rain. So uh, our, our meadows do want to go through secondary succession. Uh, they do want to turn into forests. So we need active management to keep them from doing that. In the old days, they were prevented um, the very old days, they were prevented from returning to forest by the large Pleistocene mammals that were here, the mammoths, the giant sloth, the, the, you know, we had 40 species of rhinoceros, believe it or not. They were all eating those plants, and it was much more of a savanna-like landscape. Um, well, we got rid of them, uh, and, but then the Native Americans had a regular burning schedule. That kept things uh, open, too. Uh, then we, we essentially got rid of the Native Americans too and got rid of the burning schedule and things have closed in. And we tend to think of that as normal. It's probably not. Um, so uh, how do you maintain your meadow? The, the standard recommendation is to mow or burn one third of your meadow each year. So a third, a third, a third. So any one area is only treated once every three years. Um, mowing in order to control woodies is not a good plan because it doesn't control them. It'll knock them down, but it doesn't kill the roots. And each year that root system gets a little big, bigger. That's why our property exploded when they stopped mowing because they had been mowing for years and they had giant rootstocks. You know, it looked like Sleeping Beauty's castle almost immediately. So it's much better to spot treat those woodies um, rather than try to use mowing as a control. But you do have to mow every, every once in a while to keep it as, as a meadow. The part you mow, you are gonna kill everything. You just have to accept that. That's why you don't mow or burn the whole thing at once. The two thirds you don't mow or, or burn will colonize the one third that you, you did. And that's how you keep things going. And the time to do it would be uh, you know March, depending on where you live. Oh, okay, very good. Um, any tips on getting rid of wild morning glory? Um, there, there are a couple species. Uh, so there's bindweed and there's, there's, there's field bindweed. One of them's native, one of them's not. They both have really deep root systems. They're really tough, tough to get, to get rid of. Um, no, I don't have any tips. <laughs> <laughs> That's being honest. <laughs> Very good. How about this? Are there, um, what are the best oaks for New England? And you talked a little bit about the white oak and the red oak, I believe. Right, um, right. Are those the ones we should be planting? 
You know, I had I had a student compare 16 species of oaks uh, this past year um, to figure out which one's supporting the most insects. Because always say, people say which which oaks are the are the best. Uh, and the white oak group, there's two main groups where we are: the white oak group and the red oak group. The white oak group has the white oak, the post oak, the chestnut oak, uh, and and a few others. Uh, the red oak group has the red oak, the pin oak, uh, you know, willow oak, and a few others. The white oak group is a little bit better than the red oak group, but not much, not much. It's more important these days to try to dodge the diseases that we brought in for oaks. We've got bacterial leaf scorch, which is clobbering the red oak group where I am. So it's better to focus on the white oaks. Um, but as you move a little farther west, you've got oak wilt, which clobbers the white oaks. So uh, I, I, I would not worry about which are the best oaks um, for supporting the insects. And I would, I would pick the oak that is gonna be least susceptible to the diseases in your, in your area. Uh, in New England, red oak is, is very powerful. Black oak is very powerful. White oak is very powerful. Uh, you know, one thing I didn't mention is, is um, dwarf chestnut oak or, or dwarf, um, what's the other one? Dwarf chinkapin oak. These are small oaks that you can you can put in small yards. Not all oaks are gigantic, uh, so that's that's a valuable landscape tool because a lot of people say I just don't have room for an oak, and you and you don't have room for a big oak, but everybody's got room for a small oak. Thank you, um, and we're getting close to time, but there have been a few questions about um, the type of support that you feel you get for your effort, um, such as the National Park Service. Are they supportive of your efforts and other agencies? You mean financially? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> the type of support, the support I'm getting for my work is coming from, from you people. You know, it's the interest. Uh, this is a grassroots, we've got a, a global biodiversity problem, but it's got a grassroots solution. Um, I would love to be part of Biden's 3030 plan, where we're going to preserve 30% of the country by 2030. Um, nobody's asked me yet, uh, but I'd love to have some input there. But it's, it's this is not going to come down from, from top-down regulation. Uh, it's going to come from, from changing the culture from the bottom up, where everybody realizes that their little piece of the, of the world is important. And the things I said to do, are they're, they're not hard. You don't have to be a restoration ecologist specialist to do these things. Um, so I don't know if anybody uh, would like to support what we're doing. Uh, Homegrown National Park needs your support. It, it's it's uh, financially strapped. You know, we don't have a membership fee, so we're trying to run this website and stuff with, with nothing. So that doesn't work. Um, Okay. A little, a little donate button on there if you want to. Uh, <laughs> well, that, that is good to know because that's important too. Um, so I, I want to thank you, Doug, for spending the time with us. You, uh, it's been amazing. You've answered so many of our questions and given inspired us. Well, thanks forward. for the opportunity. Yeah. And I also want to let everyone know that we did record tonight. So please, um, you can go back to watch this. If you've missed some of Doug's notes and you, or you want to know some websites, please go back and watch it. It'll be on our website probably in, in two weeks. So look for it there. So thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Okay. Be good well. Night. Thank, thank you, Doug.